Well, welcome back, everyone. How nice to see you again. And can I say, if you're watching online, hello. We're so pleased that uh, you've joined us, and I hope you've enjoyed the discussion so far. So we now turn to the third of uh, our Kavli Prizes, the one in neuroscience. And the winners have addressed one of the most fundamental problems, which is how sounds are transformed into hearing. And into that, why some of us can hear better than others and some not at all. For their pioneering work on the molecular and neural mechanisms of hearing, the winners are Jim Hudspeth of the Rockefeller, Robert Fettiplace of the University of Wisconsin-Madison, and Christine Putty of the Collège de France Pasteur Institute. So let's just set ourselves up by seeing a short film. Excellent, look at that. That's amazing. So there we're measuring movements of, uh, you know, 10 nanometers. Isn't that amazing? Can you see it? So, two direction. Can you see it there? And that's the movement of the, of the hairs. So we're actually projecting the hairs onto a diode and then looking at the light on the diodes and that's showing the movement. I work on hair cells. These are sensory cells in the ear, in the, in, inside the ear, that detect sound and they detect also motion of the head and, uh, and acceleration. But the ones we work on detect sound and we're interested in how they detect sound, that is how the sound is converted into electrical signals and how they uh, distinguish between different pitches or different frequencies in the sound. It's like a prism. In the light prism, you, you shine white light onto the, onto the prism, and this then breaks up the different colors, and you can project them, as Newton showed. The, the, the cochlea behaves like an acoustic prism, where you can input wideband noise, which has got all frequencies in it, and the hair cells will separate the frequencies along the cochlea. So low frequencies are present at one end and high frequencies are present at the other. The ear is not just passive. It doesn't just receive sound. It actually has an amplifier built into it. So the amplifier makes sound louder by 100 to 1,000 times. It sharpens our frequency sensitivity. It gives us a very broad dynamic range so we can hear everything from dropped pen to a jet plane taking off. When the basilar membrane is set into motion, the 16,000 hair cells along its length are stimulated mechanically the hair bundles, which are the tiny clusters of filament protruding from the top of the hair cells, begin to oscillate back and forth. And the hair bundles have, between each of the fine filaments, a sort of a filament called the tip link. And that tip link is attached to ion channels that can open and close. So every time you hear a sound, the cells that respond move back and forth. And as they do, the little gates open and close, letting ions flow into the cell and setting up an electrical response. That electrical response is then propagated across a so-called chemical synapse to the nerve fiber that carries the information into the brain. The real turning point in my work was the development of the huge investment of the scientific community to try to decipher the human genome and especially to decipher the human genome analysis. I got very interested in the auditory system because this is a sense for communication in humans through language and music. Basically, we hear with only a few thousand sensory cells. And this precluded in a biochemical or even classical molecular genetic approach to be able to identify the key molecule involved in sound processing. But in such a situation, the genetic approach is perfectly appropriate because its efficacy 
is completely independent of the number of molecules or cells being involved in a given process. I am very much interested now by the cortical process, how sound is processed at the cortical level. I would like especially to focus on auditory um, cortex plasticity because, of course, we need to restore hearing at the peripheral level. But brain plasticity is absolutely essential to take advantage from this restoration. Without brain plasticity, the result will be very poor. I would say our research has two long-term goals. The first one is rather abstract, which is understanding at a molecular level exactly how the ear operates, how the channels operate, how the little strings, the tip links attached to them operate, and so on. The other goal is at the other extreme, which is trying to deal with deafness by regenerating hair cells so that people will no longer have the problems associated with different kinds of hearing loss. And ladies and gentlemen, will you welcome the winners of the 2018 Cavalry Prize in Neuroscience. You all come to this from different angles. From, for you, it's people uh, with deafness, and for you, it was turtles, and for you, it was bullfrogs. So, and yet, the thing that unites them all are these absolutely miraculous things called hair cells. And the more you see of them, the more you are completely astonished by their complexity, by the way that they work. It's, it's fantastic. But I wanted to start with you, Christine, because you see every day, you're a doctor, but uh, specialising in the genetics of deafness, you see every day uh, families where children are profoundly uh, deaf and the impact that that has. How did you get involved in looking at the genomics of this? And why is genetics so important in deafness and what's it helped the others to see? And it's first of all to correct, I don't see every day people being affected by deafness. I'm working in the lab, but I am connected with the ENTs. Okay. Uh, so, so why uh, it has been partly explained um, in, in the movie. Um, the question, we had all this fantastic background on biophysical aspects, physiological aspects generated by my colleagues, but not a single molecule having a key role at the level especially of the sensory cell called hair cell had been identified. And this was because the classical approach, biochemical approach, or let's say a classical molecular genetic approach, requires a certain amount of biological material. And we here with only a little bit that 10,000 hair cells, meaning that it was impossible to get access to this key molecule by the traditional biochemical or let's say molecular genetic approach. But genetics has not su such a requirement. Even a single molecule having a key role in hearing, if you are able to pull out the gene, will tell you which molecule is important, the molecule encoded by that gene. So that was really the starting point when I realized that we could completely unlock the molecular mechanism involved in hearing by developing a genetic approach. Now, Jim, what's your part in this story? Uh, my original interest was in understanding the initial step which is how uh, the body converts sound, which is vibrations in the air, into an electrical response that can then be sent on to the brain. All processing in the brain is fundamentally electrical in nature, so there needs to be a transduction process in which sound energy is transduced into electrical signals. 
So I focused, as you saw in the film, on this elegant structure, the hair bundle, the little cluster of feelers that sticks out of the top of the hair cell and responds mechanically to sound stimuli. And that wonderful model that you, uh, that you have of the hair cell, which is which huge, I presume that you're not, t you don't take that around with you. Where is that? Where yeah, is it? Avina had a model of a comet. I, I've taken it places before, but now uh, air transportation safety rules <laughs> make it much harder. <laughs> it looks awfully much like a multi-barreled yeah. uh, yeah. grenade launcher. <laughs> so I, I have a smaller one here made huh? of soda hey. straws oh. <laughs> stolen from Just the canteen, and it, it works. <laughs> It works the Don't same. Don't you love a man with a load of straws in his <laughs> pocket? <too>? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> but this is much easier to get through airport security. <laughs> you probably still get the same questions, though. Would you mind explaining what that is? No, they simply think I'm a lunatic, <laughs> <laughs> but harmless. It's a fine line. So uh, now, Robert, what's your part in this? Um, what's my part in it? Well, I, I mean, there are two. There are two sides to, to the hair cell story. I mean, one is um, how they detect the sound, and the other is how they discriminate different frequencies, different pitches in the sound. And in the auditory system, it, it's been a, a long problem how the auditory organ actually detects the different frequencies, analyzes them, and separates them al along, along the organ. And that's really uh, how I got into it. And, uh, um, I got into it uh, through the turtle because I'd worked on turtle photoreceptors and turtle retina and I thought, well, we'll try the turtle uh, ear. And um, we found mechanisms in the turtle that, that are used to analyze the different frequencies uh, in, in, the, uh, in the sound. We had a preparation that would, would behave as though it were... I mean, we're using a turtle because it's... Um, um, it's mechanically and metabolically robust. If you try and do this thing on sort of mammals, you know, you drill through bone, and it's 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 quite difficult to do. Whereas the turtle was was easy to get working, and it didn't didn't, uh, and and it still possessed all its the functional all the functional properties. So we we looked at the uh, we looked at the. Um, uh, how it how how it produced uh, potentials the, the the potentials were different in different hair cells along the organ, and then this led us on to looking at the uh, i mean somewhat after Jim and looking at the uh, the mechanism by which the hair motion was actually converted into an translated into an electrical signal so it's, it's very interesting that you came from the eye to the to the ear and so far we've got we've got humans uh, frogs frogs. And, and turtles. When we talk about eyes, we know that the, 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 the way that phototransduction occurs is pretty much universal across all species. Is it the same for hearing? Do all creatures hear in the same way with, this, with hair cells? All, ver all vertebrate creatures do. Yeah. I mean, this structure, the hair bundle, is absolutely universal from lampreys at the very bottom of the cardate phylogeny through um, BBC announcers and whatnot. <laughs> <laughs> The same is true of the vision, because the vision is, I mean, the, 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 the retina is, as it's, is really kind of a, a, a vertebrate uh, structure. In the vertebrates, you know, from frogs up to uh, uh, mammals, they all work in a similar way. But if you go down to sort of, you know, invertebrates, they will have all sorts of different photo detection systems. And uh, mm -hmm. mm. so they're really not analogous to, to, the, to the vertebrate retina. Mm. But will not that be interesting to mention that invertebrate, although they don't have the same structure, have the same basic principle for extracting uh, sound parameters? Yeah, quite true. There seems yeah. to be a, a parallel evolution. Yeah. And even some shared factors yeah. involved in the differentiation of the sensory cells, invertebrates and invertebrates, even though the product looks quite distinct. Mm. And, and in terms of the, you mentioned the, fr the frequency, the difference between, we saw some on the video of a uh, difference between high and low frequencies. And of course, across the animal, across the vertebrate uh, animal world, um, 
many different animals use an enormous range of frequencies, way beyond our very limited hearing. Do, what, what about, I mean, do bats, do elephants? Are we talking about, if, if we're talking about vertebrates, yes. They, there's, there's, as you go from vertebrates, if you go up from, say, reptiles to, to birds to mammals, there are changes and there's an extension of the frequency range. So, yeah, there are, there are mammals like, like uh, bats and whales that will hear, um, you know, ten times the range of humans, which is ten times the range of turtles. And that requires actually different mechanisms. And, uh, um, but still, the, it's, it's hair cells. Oh, it also, they all use hair cells, that's Amazing. correct. Yeah. And they all separate the frequencies along the organ. And so the mechanisms by which this is established must be rather similar across the vertebrate classes. So, Christine, are humans with normal hearing, are they all born with pretty much the same complement of, whatever it is, 16,000, I think you said, hair cells that then kind of degenerate with, with age? Or do some people have um, kind of more than others and have better hearing right from the start? Is there a variation in humans? Uh, we know better about those who have uh, hearing impairment than those who have a better hearing. And I think that when we are discussing better hearing, we have to be very careful because, let's say, of course, the, the peripheral auditory system, the cochlea, and its innervation have a key role in encoding, let's say, what is the equivalent of the spectrogram, okay? But thereafter, there are a lot of processes, and a better hearing could simply uh, be related to the fact that you are able to extract much more information along the central auditory pathway, for instance, pitch perception, uh, use information coming from the cochlea, but is extracting another type of information, which is the interval between frequencies. So we have not to say, okay, a better hearing is just due to, to uh, let's say, cochlea working better. There is, it seems that there is no, no real plasticity and no real difference from one cochlea to another. Okay, what could be completely different and likely is different is the way, the, especially the, the auditory cortex has been uh, wired during, uh, let's say, in, during infancy and thereafter, depending on the environment and so on. But what is, I guess that was your question, you wanted to, I guess, to discuss hearing impairment. So uh, there are um, an important proportion of children who are born with profound deafness, so they will not acquire spontaneously language. So this is why, um, uh, let's say, cochlear implants have been developed, but let's say, the, huge number of people being impaired are related, let's say, to aging and also to overexposure to noise. WHO um, mentioned that we expect, not, not we expect, but let's say, for the time being, more, more than one billion of people are um, at the risk of developing hearing impairment due to noise overexposure and especially excessive using of earphone, especially during a long time. Luckily, we're in a library. It's very quiet. <laughs> it's very quiet. To, to address your original <laughs> question, I mean, the actual threshold of hearing is really not very different in alligators and birds mm. and a whole range of mammals. I mean, they all hear rather at, at almost the same level. And turtles are not as sensitive, but they live underwater all the time. Yeah, it's always with the turtles with you, isn't it? <laughs> yes, um, I'm afraid the, so. The, uh, I, I'm interested as well in the transition uh, over life, because sometimes we think about biology as being relatively sort of static, but we do know that, 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 um, that hearing often degrades as we get older, but also that it changes between teenage years and, and adulthood. And what is, Do we know what is actually mechanistically or physically changing in the hair cells when those sort of just natural transitions through the progress of a life occur? We know more and more, especially because of this awareness regarding what we call presbycusis, 
And it seems, um, first of all, we have indications that the same gene being responsible for early onset form of deafness, when they have some specific mutation, can be responsible for monogenic single gene defect, um, uh, responsible for presbycosis. And what we know also in parallel, as I was mentioning, that presbycosis is related both to gene defect and, let's say, specific um, uh, sound environment and the interaction of the two, meaning that, for instance, oxidative stress um, related to overexposure to noise seems to have a key role, and maybe also some uh, immunity process, uh, <coughs> we don't know yet, so, but for sure, oxidative stress is central to presbycosis. But the, ul the ultimate etiology is the, the hair cells die. Okay. And, 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 the, and the key point is that they're not replaced. And they're not replaced. So the hair cells die and they die um, at, for high pitches and for whatever the underlying molecular mechanisms of overstimulation or some metabolic problem. That's, that's why we lose hearing because that the hair cells die. That cell death process, is, it, is, it, is that a sort of mechanistic thing? Is it that they are being buffeted by noise? by by Buffeted by bat out of hell, perhaps. Possibly by yes. bat out of hell, yes. so <laughs> repeatedly that they, they sort of fall apart. I think that's a question for you, Jim. Well, certainly the high, frequ high frequency cells wear out first, yes. and it is astonishing when you think about it that these little hair bundles are being driven back and forth 20,000 times a second. So they really are taking a beating. The ones at the other end of our cochleas go at only 20 hertz, mm -hmm. so it's that large a difference, a thousand fold. And what exactly happens at a molecular level that wears out, I don't think we can say, but I feel sure that just plain wear and tear is the, the main cause of damage. But they aren't moving much. They aren't moving much, but they're moving fast. That's, that's how I <laughs> think about myself. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Ish. <laughs> but what does this... Uh, I mean, th this extraordinary basic science that you've done, I mean, I, the, the field of you know, sensory perception was dominated, I suspect, by visual perception. And hearing has always had, I mean, I know you're passionate about it, hearing has always had a slightly second uh, place. And yet you all were absolutely fascinated by this and determined to go into it. What was the spark for you that made you go into this? Let's start with you, Jim. I was driven there um, when I was a graduate student. The professors in our department had the very bright idea of skipping the lectures they most hated and assigning them to us students to give. So <laughs> among those loathsome subjects was hearing, about which they knew nothing. So we students had to learn it, and I was fascinated. In part, I was, I was in a vision lab, and I had the same reaction as Robert, that vision was going along very well, there were some excellent people in the field, and hearing was somewhat neglected. Part of the difference, and part of what makes hearing research harder, is accessibility, as he's already mentioned. The visual system is in a way easy, uh, because the external world, including stimuli, is projected right onto the retina. So you can put an electrode there or at any higher level, and everything is all wired up in a neat order. Getting into the air, getting at the cells, and so on, is much more difficult uh, in the case of hearing. And that's, in fact, why we were driven to these strange animals that you've mentioned. Because they're more accessible. Because they're, they're more accessible, and we follow the usual uh, role of researchers in using the most primitive species that we can conveniently use. We don't want to use dogs, cats, monkeys, whatever, if that's not essential to the problem, as indeed it is not. Mm. And what about you, Robert? What propelled you into hearing? I, I thought it had all been done in vision. There were too many people and they were all pursuing a rather small, uh, uh, a small aim and uh, I thought it would be good to go off and do something different. This, however, was, I was mistaken because, <laughs> in fact, they hadn't figured out transduction in the photoreceptors. And this, the, the subsequent, uh, I don't know, 10 years after I started working on hair cells, there was an enormous amount of argument between various people, including the, the lab that I came from, about how it, how it all worked. And I mean, they had quite different ideas. And it was really sort of the advent of G-proteins and G-protein-coupled receptors that that actually led to the, uh, the, the breakthrough. And that's a key point, actually, for young researchers, is 
you know, the, the, the two things in life, choose your parents with care and choose your scientific subject with care. But, uh, Christine, how about you? What propelled you into hearing research? Um, I had a deep interest in sensory system in general. I work on olfaction and uh, also on vision. And um, when, let's say, the Human Genome Project started, I really threw myself in that direction, thinking that that, that will be a way for me to connect, let's say, human biology uh, to genetics. And um, for the hearing system, I was particularly fascinated by the fact that um, uh, this is, in fact, the major communication sense. Okay, we communicate. If you don't have hearing, you cannot communicate with people. And also because, as I was mentioning, I realized how powerful the genetics should be to get access to the molecular mechanism of hearing. It was just the proper technique. You have now um, dozens of labs throughout the world search engine res responsible for deafness and also uh, developing the after animal model, trying to understand what the various uh, uh, proteins are doing and so on. So that was the starting point. And where is this going? What are the opportunities? I mean, obviously we heard uh, our uh, colleagues talking about the Nanoscience Prize, talking yeah. about uh, CRISPR. Um, uh, do you see uh, deafness or the, uh, something to do with um, uh, um, the hair cells being crispered. If I, we're now using that as a verb, crispered. I, I, th I think if you could figure out what, uh, why they die with old age and why certain people lose their hearing uh, before others, you know, with old age. I mean, in the 70s, by my age, I mean, half the people are semi-deaf and Perhaps they listened to too much music earlier, but... Uh, Impossible. But the, 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 um, that, the uh, genetics that's of a, That's a big yeah. question. The genetics of it is interesting because there is... I mean, one, the, I think, are you referring to connect, one of the connexin genes as being responsible for... Yes, we have been working on that. But what we are developing is um, gene therapy replacement, OK? And we have uh, already very encouraging results in animal models, which are mouse models for deafness, because, let's say, the, the um, cochlea is very similar in terms of morphology and function between humans and, and mouse. And uh, regarding the question you ask um, about CRISPR-Cas, the problem is what cr we are dealing with cells which are not dividing anymore. Uh. And what CRISPR-Cas can do is to generate a double strand break on the DNA, and let's say within this double strand break, let's, uh, either you can have further deletion or let's say insertions. But for being able to move a mutation, to get a mutation uh, restored to a normal sequence of DNA, you need such <coughs> divide. <laughs> and our cells in the inner ear do not divide. Meaning that CRISPR-Cas9 can be used to delete a dominant allele, <coughs> but in any way it will never res restore uh, with what is the most frequent cause of deafness, autosomal recessive form of deafness, in which you want really to substitute a mutation by the normal uh, nucleotide. Mm. So no, this is one of the limits for, for the time being uh, on CRISPR-Cas9 in, in, in our... For, for now, for yeah. now. <coughs> I, and, and I think an important point is that we, um, re-establishing the capacity to divide is a key issue that a lot of people are approaching. So a number of transcription factors, gene control elements, have been identified that are necessary to establish the hair cell fate. And knowing those, people are now trying to find ways of deploying them to coax the other adjacent cells, which are called supporting cells, to convert themselves into hair cells, and by <coughs> that means to reconstitute uh, the cochlea. There's some skepticism about this, whether these cells can assume, for example, the different roles, the different frequency sensitivities, for example. Mm. We simply don't know that. And what about stem cells as a potential? This is that, that is, this th is th they are stem cells that support Well, I, I wasn't talking about stem cells, uh, or at least not exogenous stem cells. I was talking about the fact that there are already multipotent cells, so in a sense, locally, 
uh, uh, capable stem cells that can be caused to become hair cells. And these are the cells that are a normal source of hair cells during development. Okay. One of the things I love about this as a prize, recognizing the three of you, is that you represent quite a diverse set of academic backgrounds. Uh, not We talked about, we, you know, made a joke about the turtles and the frogs and, and the humans, but there's a very, you know, there's, there's <coughs> genetics and clinical, there's mechanistic and there's, there's physiology. And I, 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 we talked earlier a little bit about academic collaborations and you, you guys all knew each other before the, the, mm -hmm. the prize, before becoming laureates. But how, how well joined up is the world of hearing in terms of, uh, in terms of whether the physiologists are talking to the geneticists and, and how those collaborations work? Any of you, feel free. <laughs> well, I mean, I mean you're, you're the best example in a way yes. because your colleagues include a number of physiologists, yes. anatomists, yes. and so on, as well as the genetic contingent. It's a very strong collaboration. Sure. I mean, together you've, you've produced this astonishing body of knowledge al al already, but what remains to be discovered in this field? So many things. <laughs> <laughs> well, and why the high-frequency cells die first and cause presbycusis is one. Another one is what mechanisms are involved in laying out this map along, along the organ. So, frequencies, low pitches are at one end and high pitches at the other, and there's a gradation. And this is important because it, it's, it's followed in, into the brain, and in each bit of the brain there will be the same map where low frequencies will be on one side of the, of the piece of brain and, and high frequencies will be on the other side. And this is, this is kind of an important point there because you want different pictures, pictures that are similar to interact with each other. So nerve cells coding for different pictures should interact if they have similar frequency frequencies. But, but the mechanisms that establish this in the, in the cochlea is, is actually, I think, an important uh, thing to really understand. That, so they lay, they lay down in a specific order and there's specific patterning to the positioning of the hair yes. cells according to frequency. Is that the same across all species? Yes. And they have different properties, so it's like a whole set of neurons <coughs> with, with different properties. I mean, that's what's remarkable about it. So it's like saying, you know, piece of the brain, but actually if you go from one part of the visual cortex across to another bit, that the, the, the properties will change systematically with position to, to detect different features. And it's worth emphasizing the scale of the issue. In vision, we have four types of photoreceptors. So we have the night photoreceptor, the rod, and then we have red, green, and blue cones. It's easy enough to specify four things by switching on four different genes, for example, and much of it is done that way. In the case of the so-called tonotopic array that Robert is talking about, pitch being represented by place, you have a cochlea that's 30 millimeters long, and each of about 1,500 different segments is tuned to a different frequency. So it's, you know, the necessity is to to, I should say 4,500, so 4,500 different pitches are represented. So somehow you have to specify that genetically. It's certainly not done with 4,500 distinct genes. So there must be gradients or some other mechanism mm -hmm. to, to lay that down. And that's, that's I, I'm in danger of this turning into a seminar because this is precisely my, my <laughs> academic background. But that, that isn't known, the developmental pattern of the genes responsible for pattern formation in the, in the cochlea, that, that's not. There's known. been some clues in chickens. <laughs> as good as it gets. Yes. <laughs> what to be said about chicken biology? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Do you think we ought to let yes. the audience ask some questions? Uh, yes. It's, it's a, it, we, we could be guilty of just talking to them for hours. I didn't. I forgot that really you guys were here, actually. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, so if we could raise the red lights and wait for the microphone to come to you, and um, if you could just identify yourself, and then we'll. I should say that we have an audience who are largely, if I may be so bold, ladies and gentlemen, are in their prime and possibly at that end of the spectrum where hearing loss might perhaps <laughs> become apparent. <laughs> Not quite yet, obviously. Do you, do you know the most sensitive humans are adolescent girls? They have the full <laughs> range of frequencies. Adolescent males have probably been doing something else to reduce their... Uh, and, and on to the question. And on to the question. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Uh, Bruce Piercy, 
uh, retired IT. Okay. Uh, you've mentioned a lot how the cells respond to different frequencies, and this has been mentioned like 10 times in this talk, but I've never understood how they react to different frequencies. I mean, you, the, you've explained that it's a mechanical process, the opening of an ion channel, uh, but what's to keep a high frequency bundle of these hairs from reacting to a low frequency sound? So okay, so that answer? question was a top question, yeah. which is basically yeah. why doesn't a high frequency yeah. set off all the low frequency uh, hairs? So how do, they, how do they know what's going? So it, it's, an, it's an electrical process. So the, the in, 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 um, so, so when the hairs move, there, is, there are ions flow into the cell and they change the membrane potential across the, the, the potential across the membrane. And there are special proteins in that membrane that, uh, that change with, with, with as, the, as the membrane potential changes. And different cells have different sets of proteins, different numbers and different kinds of proteins. And for at least for, 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 for reptiles and for birds, they behave like miniature electrical resonators. So if you, if, they all, if you stimulate them all with the same frequency, they will resonate at different, different, different frequencies. It's like taking a set of bells and you hit them all with the same hammer and they will ring at different frequencies. But it's an electrical mechanism. Now the mechanism that's used in mammals is somewhat different and I'll talk about that on Thursday. <laughs> well, but it's worth mentioning that the film showed it. You saw that picture of that flat membrane that resonated at three different places mm -hmm. for three distinct pitches. That's called the basilar membrane, and it's an elastic structure on which the 16,000 hair cells are standing. And there's a rather complicated hydrodynamic event such that sound coming in at one end moves as a traveling wave, moves a certain distance, and then causes a maximum excursion that's frequency dependent. So a high frequency causes a vibration near the base, a low frequency propagates farther and causes a vibration near the tip. The hair cells in those different positions are then tuned to those respective frequencies. That makes sense. Yeah. Mm. And, and Jim, you talk in your bi uh, uh, biography that you wrote about the beauty of this system. I mean, it, it, it is extraordinarily beautiful. Well, the hair cells themselves are beautiful. The hair bundles are exquisite, not this one, but the ones, that, <laughs> the ones, the ones in the pictures. Uh, what I find amazing about it is that nature was confronted with a strange problem. How do you convert vibrations in the ear into an electrical response? And as with many other uh, products of natural selection, it's, it's extraordinary to see what nature came up with. This strain gauge, which as I mentioned in one of the little articles, is not unlike what Fred Kavli did for a living. Mm -hmm. He made strain gauges that were used in models of planes and whatnot to detect local deformation. This is a strain gauge. It's used in our cochlea to measure sound vibrations, but it's used also in our vestibular labyrinth to measure motions of the head, rotations, everything else. It's simply deployed in different ways to measure different stimuli. Absolutely fascinating. Mm. <coughs> this gentleman here. My name is Mohi Abdelgani. Uh, as I, in, I in you, introduced myself, uh, analytical, organic chemist, uh, but now I have to add a little bit more. Uh, I got interested in this last few years on writing on about science, uh, uh, natural science things, including, and I got very, very interested in the origin of the language. Uh, the origin of the language uh, obliged to, uh, no, uh, when you think about it, you have to read from uh, phonetics to uh, go to through the brain and the molecular uh, biology also. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm going to think a little bit high, uh, with a high, and I want to uh, comment because uh, uh, through the discussion between the inter uh, interviewer, I got a uh, problem with uh, uh, plasticity. 
Uh, uh, there is two theories of the origin of the language. Uh, one theory say that it's, uh, it is bi biologically. And the others, uh, the others say, no, that's something we learn over time. Uh, of course, we learn over time, that is the, the, the real, we, we know it. The one he born in Egypt, it's not, uh, he, he speak in Arabic or Egyptian. Uh, uh, the one he born in England, he, he will speak English. It's no, no, no problem about that. But uh, uh, actually, your, uh, uh, your uh, uh, research, if I understand you correct, it say that each cell, each hair cell has a fixed frequency. Is that true? Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's take that. Let's take that question now in general, which is, it, it's about plasticity and uh, language. Mm -hmm. And you started to talk about uh, language mm -hmm. uh, and, and plasticity because, presumably, if you've been uh, if you've been uh, profoundly deaf all your life and you suddenly get uh, hearing yeah. returned to you, actually, you have a mm -hmm. problem, don't you? Yeah, there is a huge difference um, between profoundly deaf children and let's say having, uh, for, for instance, receiving a cochlear implant. And if you can hear what is delivered as information from a cochlear implant is very far away from the acoustic signal. Meaning that these children will develop language with a uh, and, uh, based on acoustic information, which is quite different from, let's say, normal language. So, in, in, in a way, um, this la language center will develop based on the capacity to extract meaning from the sequence that they receive. If you are profoundly deaf from birth, and never receive cochlear implant, but receive cochlear implant late during your life, language acquisition will be rather poor. There are some differences between people, but okay. And this is for sure related to the plasticity of the auditory cortex and above. So, but, uh, okay, okay. So, hey, thank you. Fantastic. Bob has a question next. We wait for the mic. Yes, I'm Bob Kahn from the Kavli Foundation. Um, we had an experience in the United States in the 70s of a senator from the good state of Wisconsin. I was on the faculty at that time at Wisconsin, Proxmire, and he gave something called the Golden Fleece Award. And it was given to people who did research that seemingly had no relationship to really understanding uh, things. Uh, so people working on flies were thought to have be working on irrelevant information. He would give them the Golden Fleece Award. And, uh, <clears throat> you know, it was denigrating. So what's interesting here is you've worked on turtles, you've worked on frogs, you've worked on unusual or usual animals. And I think for a general audience, it's important to understand why working on Apparently, zebrafish, very simple animals, is so profoundly important to advancing basic science in so many areas, yours in particular. So maybe you could expand a bit on why working on animals, simple, somewhat more complex, etc., is always relevant, really always relevant, and should not get Golden Fleece Awards. So, so, so yeah. So the, so the, the question is, it's a, it's a terrific question, that, that we have a diversity of organisms, experimental organisms that you three have worked on, but in the broader field of, the, of all of the biological sciences, there are some standard uh, model organisms and there are some exceptional model organisms. In fact, I've never met a scientist who started, who worked on turtles before until today. So, so could may, maybe, I, I mean, I guess it's, it's primarily to you two, but I know that mice is a big part of your work. What is the justification, what is the interest in using different model, model organisms for something as diverse as hearing? I, I think it's... Um, I used to publish in the Journal of Physiology, and the Journal of Physiology was rather the Journal of Human Physiology, but they'd have these divisions. So if you worked on a, uh, a, a mechanism of, of, of some process, like hearing, among animals that were, that were similar, 
then you could publish in this journal of physiology because it would ultimately be applicable to humans. But if you were looking at some kind of uh, analytical process, so for example, some uh, uh, part of a brain, you know, and, and you would Drosophila brains and, and uh, human brains were not considered the same and, and therefore they, they would not publish the Drosophila stuff. I, I think there's something to this that you can, it's, it's important to get all the information. And if it involves molecules, the likelihood is that the molecules will move across, across the kingdoms and across the classes. But, but an organization like the organization of the visual cortex, for example, will be such and such in, in, in cats, but will be quite different in, in, a, in, a, in, a, in an invertebrate. And, and that, so there is, a, that's not reason not to work on it, but you should be aware that there are these differences, functional differences. I think Bob's point was a, was a, a, a broader one in some senses about uh, why the public need to know that actually this work is uh, important uh, because you, know, you might have these diverse species, but actually studying them does give you really important information. Right. And this is a complex puzzle. Different species are particularly good at, at answering specific questions. So we use zebrafish. And we use those because they can regenerate their hair cells. And we can then ask at a molecular level, what's different about that capacity that mammals have lost? We use geckos, the lizards that climb on the wall, because they have a particularly strong active process, the amplifier in the ear, which is the first thing that burns out in human ears as we begin to become deaf. We use frogs because the cells are big and hardy and easy to record from in a dish. We use chinchillas because the traveling wave on that membrane that I mentioned is particularly easy to observe there. So each of those species is chosen to get at a particular question, but the answers are quite general. We have every reason to believe that what we found in any of those species applies equally well to humans. And, and we, sh we shouldn't ignore the historical aspect to animal research as well, which is that we use the animals we understand the best for reasons which aren't necessarily scientific. Mostly we use mice because in the 19th century people used to breed mice for competitions, and so we had genetic backgrounds no, no, for, we, we for mice. We use mice because we can manipulate the gene, and especially with CRISPR-Cas9 right. so easily. Well, yeah, now, so we can ask right. a number of questions and now have the response very quickly. So, so far, there is no equivalent. The zebrafish has also this possibility, but uh, turtle and so on is not yet developed. So yeah. the question is more, which type of animals now would like to move and make, make it, um, let's say, a genetic animal that we could manipulate, for instance, we could uh, move to gerbil and develop all these uh, genetic tools because it has um, a hearing uh, frequency uh, range which is close to that of humans. We have a lot of possibility, but okay, which one will, will we yeah. see? Oh. Who knew that gerbils have the same frequency, hearing frequency <laughs> as humans? <laughs> <laughs> and that's, that's why you got the prize. Yes, <laughs> that's why you got the prize. That's the only reason why you got the Cavalier Prize. <laughs> Obviously, well, let's, let's not forget as well the yes. 2016, one of the 2016 Cavalier laureates, Eve Marder, worked on lobsters and, and elucidated enormous, you know, we've, we've learned so much about um, our own neurology and neuro neuroscience from looking at lobsters. So it's a, basically it's, a, it's a, a menagerie, a zoo. Let's have another question. I'm Bassam Shakashiri from the University of Wisconsin. My question goes beyond the mechanisms of changing sound energy into electrical energy. It goes into perception and, and the formation of synapses and how they function. Um, and, and so if I subject myself to um, hard rock music, um, do different synapses form than if I subjected myself to classical music? And how does that affect my, my perception of the world? <laughs> <laughs> so the question is, um, which should we be listening to Led Zeppelin or Beethoven? Yes, mm. but, but actually, presumably, um, and I, I don't know whether this is the right answer or not, it doesn't matter whether it is actually Led Zeppelin or Beethoven. Doesn't it depend on the volume at which you're playing it? Except you can only play Led Zeppelin really Not loudly. on Led Zeppelin. <laughs> <laughs> 
not only the volume, this is the volume, let's say, intensity multiplied by the duration of time exposure, which is critical. And I think that a strong message that will be bring to, to the public, um, because they use hearing aids, so they, they cannot uh, receive, let's say, intensity sound exceeding, I think, about 100 decibel, but there is no indication um, related to the fact that if they are using here it had at this sound intensity during hours, even sleeping, of, of, uh, especially for teenagers, that they will damage their, their, their sensory cells. I think that uh, there is also another question, may maybe within the question related to uh, uh, music, generally speaking, how the um, training of music has an impact of what you can hear in general. There is a system, we, don't, uh, uh, we did not speak about it, which is extremely well developed in the auditory system, which is not only the afferent system, bringing the information from the cochlea to the brain, but an efferent system, which is extremely efficient and which control even, let's say, the coding of, uh, um, at the early step of, um, of the propagation of encoded information in the peripheral system and just after, there is a control meaning that a musician uh, do not hear, let's say, um, just after the cochlea and the afferent um, uh, neurons have not the same information that his brain will process. So let's have another question from the audience. Yeah. There's a gentleman in the front here. So um, I'm Adam Falk. I'm the president of the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation in the United States. Um, I was going to offer a long defense of heavy metal music, but I'm going to pass on that. <laughs> um, it, it's taken as read. Yeah. Yes. So the, the question I have is about the different frequency ranges that different animals are uh, sensitive to. And one of the things that's so interesting about your work is the way in which mechanical systems are interacting with neural system and electrical systems. And so my question is whether, what sorts of differences in these systems one sees in different creatures that have very different sensitivity ranges uh, in terms of frequency, and whether they're doing the same thing over wide varieties of frequencies, or whether there are different systems that are, are used in these different parts of the frequency bands. So I guess that's for you, uh, uh, Jim, because I think of you about your bullfrogs. And obviously, if you're a bullfrog, you really want to hear the low notes. <laughs> yes, so there, there's one other level of modification that enters into the answer. And that is even before the sensory cells get the information, that information is shaped by the external ear and by the middle ear. There's, those are the little bones that conduct sound into the ear and they're very into the cochlea and there are various modifications of that. And that, those structures themselves are quite variable. So for example, animals that hear at very low frequencies, like some rodents that live down in tunnels and the like, have large resonance spaces in their skulls that basically oscillate or allow sound to oscillate at particular frequencies so they can hear well the low frequency sounds in tunnels that act like organ pipes at, at low frequencies. They can tell if something is crawling into their tunnel or whatever. At the other extreme, animals like bats that need to go to very high frequencies to have effective sonar have everything greatly miniaturized. So the hair bundles, instead of being on the order of 10 micrometers tall, are as short as one micrometer. And that makes them act like tuning forks that are tuned to much higher frequencies. So exactly the same apparatus is used over and over again, but it's contoured, it's tuned in different ways to adjust to different frequencies, different lifestyles, different needs. It reminds me of one of my favorite experiments from the history of science, from my personal hero, Charles Darwin, who played the bassoon to earthworms uh, in order to establish whether they could hear bassoon music. Did it work? No. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> it was his son who played the bassoon. <laughs> I'm afraid that we've come to the end of our time. And I don't know about you, ladies and gentlemen, but I am just now a devotee of hearing research. <laughs> I mean, it, it's not one that's had an enormous profile, but actually you only have to listen to these laureates to realize the wonder and glory mm -hmm of our auditory system, and indeed understand how much they have done to expose 
and reveal its wonder to the rest of us. There are many questions yet to be answered in the hearing space. Uh, there are many needs of people with hearing loss, as you said, uh, Christine. But we've had uh, an enormous treat, I think you'll agree, Adam, listening to you. Thank you so much. Thank you.